Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to realestateinvestormba.com. At Real Estate Investor MBA, we strive to provide valuable information from various experts within the business and real estate community, covering real-time market and economic information as well as curriculum-level material within various real estate investing niches. We aim to be relevant, straightforward, and forthcoming with actionable information for our community. And here's your hosts, Tejas Gosai and Jeremy Moyer. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to your favorite real estate podcast. This is Real Estate Investor MBA. Uh, Our short website now is rei.mba. And the regular website is realestateinvestormba.com. We transcribe our podcasts. We have videos that can be viewed and you can listen to us on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and a bunch of other resources. Jeremy, my co-host uh, below me, Jeremy Moyer, and I, Tejas Gosai, helped create this show. And we've had a tremendous amount of friends and family and colleagues that have really supported us. So um, I'd like to start by saying thank you to everybody. And it's amazing the guests we have. Um, one little thing, I am a manager of a private equity fund with my partner, over here, John uh, Levine, and we have some information available at www.lvpefund.com. And with that said, Jeremy, we have an awesome guest today, and John helped us bring him on. Can you give the intro? Absolutely. Thank you, Tages. Today we have Michael Byrne uh, with us. He's one of the North America's leading experts and futurists on the retail industry. Uh, so as a founder and president of MJB Consulting. He's amassed more than 20 years of experience in conducting market analysis, devising tenanting strategies, advising on project site plans, and spearheading recruitment efforts on behalf of developers, landlords, investors, and as well as municipalities across the United States, Canada, and the UK. The firm has long been active across the region locally to us uh, in Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. They have recent projects and engagements in Philadelphia, Phoenixville, Atlantic City, Newark, and also Westfield, New Jersey, among several others. Michael is a regular presenter and keynote speaker at industry conferences, uh, some including the International Downtown Association, National Main Street Center, the International Council of Shopping Centers, International Economic Development Council, and the Urban Land Institute. Michael has lectured at the University of Pennsylvania and the University of California, Berkeley. He's often quoted uh, in high profile publications such as the Financial Times, The Street, Planning, and Washington Post. In addition to his widely followed retail contrarian blog, Michael's also a contributor to and founding board member of the new online publication called the American Downtown Revitalization Review. He's also penned numerous articles for magazines and also has authored an essay for an upcoming book on the history of Main Street movement and written a chapter in a recently published volume on the urbanization of the suburbs called Suburban Remix, Creating the Next Generation of Urban Places. Before founding MJB Consulting, Michael worked on market studies and commercial revitalization for planning consultancy, leasing and acquisitions for urban retail developer and policy analysis for citywide elective officials. That was a mouthful and I cut a lot out. (laughs) Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks thank for having you. me. Yeah, so much for being here. And and real quick, I'm just going to give a quick uh, intro. I can't find my point in the right direction on John. Yeah, um, to your right. Yes. <laughs> to uh, me, anyway. Yes. Uh, so J- John Levine is uh, a mentor of mine, and I met him years ago at a publicly traded company. Um, he's the chief investment officer of the Lehigh Valley Private Equity Fund. And he spent 25 years in the real estate sector, having started as a director of taxation for one of the largest strip center developers in the country at the time, after being instrumental in helping to create um, NYSE listed real estate company and becoming its vice president of finance. John left the industry a couple of years to start his own aircraft financing and charter company, purchasing financing and selling millions of dollars worth of business aircrafts around the world. Uh, John re-entered the real estate industry as a consultant for a New York City-based shopping center 
owner who was ramping up the operation, embarking on an acquisition spree that created a company which went from 30 million worth of assets to over 500 million in the period of three years. Acting as the controller and then as a cash manager, John was responsible for investing all available funds on a daily basis. Recently, John has worked with two real estate investment trusts managing their lease administration and National Tenant Collections Group. Um, so John and I uh, have been working together on the We Have Valley Private Equity Fund, and he suggested that we have Michael on. So we're all here. Jeremy, um, let's get into some questions and some fun stuff. Yeah, we have a lot to unpack. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, I have quite a few questions for you, Michael. First off, how do you really feel about the retail space as an asset class, specifically in today's economic environment and with everything going on? Yeah, you know, um, I'm not as uh, down and despondent about it as you're probably hearing elsewhere. Um, uh you know, I think that, uh, and this this is the title of one of the articles that I recently wrote. Um, I, I I think about, as probably a number of you do, what Warren Buffett says to do in situations like this. Uh, of course, we all know to be be fearful when others are greedy, but the more relevant piece right now is to be greedy when others are fearful. And obviously, there's a lot of fear out there, and there are a number of retailers. Uh, a surprisingly high number um, of retailers, anchor retailers, uh, that are channeling that very proverb. They are on the hunt um, for new locations. Um, they are uh, aggressively expanding. Um, and that poses opportunities, especially for certain types of centers uh, and projects, uh, which you, which you can get into a little more later. I'm not saying that there's uh, not a lot of bleakness out there, um, but if you pick your spots, if you really get nuanced about it, um, there are diamonds in the rough. And, and, you know, I think all of us have have seen those statistics which compare the uh, amount of retail space per capita in the United States to other, other countries um, and, and show that, you know, we have as much as five times, if not more. Uh, retail space in a lot of Western European countries. Um, uh, yeah, if you have a large portfolio, that's that's probably more relevant. But retail happens in the micro, not in the macro. And even when you're oversupplied in the aggregate, um, there are still opportunities uh, in the nooks and crannies that can be quite lucrative, uh, even now. So I guess I'm not so uh, despondent. And, you know, I, I think my, my, my main point with this is try as best you can to ferret out the noise. There's a lot of noise out there, right? There's, there's a lot of uh, forecasts, you know, um, arguably uh, skewing on the sensationalist side about where we're going with certain types of commercial real estate. Um, I'll remind you, if you were to start a project today, not, not that you are necessarily starting a project today, if you were to start a project today, uh, the time it by the time it comes online, we will likely uh, be be uh, some way past the crisis stage. Um, in certain parts of the country, uh, depending on the regulatory climate, um, we'll be well past uh, the crisis stage. Um, so I, I think we need to keep the long term uh, front of mind here, and again, try as best we can to, to ferret out the noise. And uh, so, yeah, that's. That's, that, that, that would be my, um, my summation. A lot of Sorry? the, Michael, that you were kind of mentioning is derived from this awesome article you published. Mm -hmm. um, so greedy while others are fearful. This is on LinkedIn and a bunch of other places. Um, you can find Michael on LinkedIn, but this is a wonderful article. It's extremely in-depth, you know, just, just really lays out a lot of what you're talking about. Actually, yeah, there's two articles you did. There's uh, this was the first one where retail recovers. For, or no, this is the second one. That's the second one. Yeah. Okay. So so this one was published uh, in July, and um, references Warren Buffett. Some of the things that you said, and then this one was a follow up that that you just published, uh, you know, a little bit more recently. Um, so I just wanted the listeners to kind of know that this stuff is available and you are a fantastic writer. I said that before we started, um, but Jeremy, I know you have a follow-up. Absolutely. Michael, you mentioned 
um, that some retailers are seeing this as an opportunity to be greedy. Yeah. Um, and they're like doubling down, maybe tripling down on looking for locations to expand their footprints because um, they probably have this five, 10 year pipeline mentality, right? Long term vision. Um, and they see what the opportunity the present has provided them. Do you have a list of some retailers um, that are actually doing that or that maybe even retail subcategories that? are actively pursuing a, um, a growth in the industry? Yeah. No, so, I mean, I, I, uh, uh, there are a number of, of specific uh, tenants in that uh, greedy, when others are fearful article. And I'll, I'll summarize here. You know, and I think to your point, Ermi, I think it, it's it's not just a ten or five, five to ten year pipeline, but it's also the realization that, hey, actually, this is a great time to be expanding because, frankly, landlords don't quite have the leverage they did uh, not a lot long ago, right? Um, uh, you know, uh, there are going to be opportunities to secure desirable real estate in coveted markets at um, discounted rates. Uh, and the savvy retailers and the ones that have the balance sheet uh, to move on that, um, many of them are doing so. So, you know, the categories that I highlighted in that article, um, perhaps the most obvious one is grocery. Um, although, uh, you know, grocery has become a far more complex category than it used to be. Um, and actually, the, the most most of the expansion-minded retailers are not necessarily the ones that immediately come to mind. Um, uh, you know, perhaps the most no, – the one that will buy, get by far the most tension and already to some extent has started to is Amazon, not only with Whole Foods, but with this new Amazon Fresh concept, which it's rolling out first, uh, it, it seems, in Southern California as well as Chicagoland – um, but has also been looking uh, quite uh, seriously in the Philadelphia area. Uh, it's a more traditional mid-market grocery banner. Um, and, and Amazon's thinking here is to some degree, in my mind at least, um, an outcome of having uh, um, made a suboptimal purchase uh, three years ago. Whole Foods, um, in the grand scheme of things, is a bit player. I mean, one to two percent market share. If they really wanted to make a splash in 2017, um, Kroger would have been uh, 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 would have had a, more, a larger impact. Not to say Kroger was was for sale. Um, Whole Foods didn't really get Amazon to where it needs to go. Amazon needs a nationwide physical footprint to rationalize the unforgiving costs of online delivery. Um, and that's, in my mind, what this new format is all about. And so they're going to move quickly uh, to expand it across the country. Um, that will probably be the biggest news, but there are a lot of other um, um, grocers, whether in the special, uh, whether in the natural foods category with Sprouts, whether in um, the uh, deep discount category with Grocery Outlet, which has, you know, obviously um, arrived in the Philadelphia market. Um, along with obviously Aldi and, and, and Lidl, um, uh, there there are some niche players that have been pretty aggressive as well. Um, so, and, and even some of the other other retailers in other categories that but that specialize in food, like BJ's, for instance, mm. um, BJ's Wholesale Club, they are expanding. So that's grocery, um, and you know. Aside from that, also some other essential retailers, Target's continuing with its flexible format stores, tractor supply um, in more rural markets. Um, the off-pricers as well, they've gotten a lot of criticism because they have um, they resolutely de-emphasize um, online, the online channel. Um, however, I expect them to continue uh, to, to thrive um, in, in the months and years ahead, as they have for, uh, you know, for many years um, going backwards, uh, you know, going back, um, uh, you know, TJ Maxx, um, TJX, arguably the best retailer in the business has been for a long time. I'd never bet against them, but also the Burlington's of the world, the Rosses, um, you know, and even some of the uh, category killer retailers are opening discount Banners, Dick Sporting Goods, for instance, uh, has been rolling out this new overtime 
um, format, which is uh, kind of off price on, you know, your Nike and your Adidas clothing and, 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 and athletic apparel. So off price discount. Um, and I would add to that, um, especially uh, in, in centers that are, you know, in lower tier uh, centers, um, which need to backfill vacant anchor spaces, a lot of deep discount retailers are going to be aggressive, whether that's Ollie's or Big Lots or Harbor Freight. Um, home goods, uh, um, a few in particular, uh, home goods owned by TJ Maxx, but also um, at home. Obviously, the home category has been doing quite well uh, in the last month or two. Um, the theory being that, you know, people aren't eating out, they're not traveling. So, hey, let's spruce up our homes. Uh, I don't know how long term that will last, but um, uh, there seems to be a number of retailers expanding there. And, and finally, there are some um, uh, uh, scattered opportunities in some of the category killer categories. Uh, category killers. Um, you know, the, these, these big box stores that specialize largely in one line of merchandise, they've been hit hard by e-commerce um, because e-commerce does what they do just better. Um, and that's why power centers have been um, have been on the decline as a format. Um, but in certain uh, categories, there are retailers trying to jockey for market share. Um, and so you're still seeing some growth, uh, for instance, uh, sporting goods. Um, uh, fabrics and I mean crafts. Uh, Hobby Lobby is 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 remaining quite aggressive. Um, so you know there are some opportunities here and there as well. But those are all uh, discussed in that um, Reedy Wallers are fearful article. And again, I, I just want to point out a lot of this, uh, you know, is is more time sensitive than it usually is because things are moving quickly. But I try to update that article to make sure that it's it's still reflecting current plans. Uh, among these retailers. No, that, that was great, Michael. It, it seems like the answer you just provided with the store names and categories, it's, it's, I guess you can say commercial and re even retail as a subsector even has many different subsectors with under retail, right? And it's, it's specific to what is necessary right now, where, where you kind of see the future going a little bit and it seems like those are the players that are or the, the sub sectors that are being bullish um, yeah. with, with their with their acquisitions or citing at least um, yeah. I, I'm an avid reader I, I read a lot on the economy as well um, and I, I just love markets and, and whatnot I, I hear this term um, retail apocalypse right yeah. yeah and I'm sure you've heard it as well um, you know, with the rise of e-commerce, you know, especially right now, I don't know if this is just pour gasoline on that term and the use of it across the industry, you know, death to retail and, you know, this is, things are going to blow up. And it seems like some sectors, as you mentioned, are actually growing, but I'm sure there's also some subsectors of retail that aren't. Right. Um, you know, what, where do you see e-commerce playing a role? Um in all this, and do you see some sectors being exposed yeah. uh, in retail? Um, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, certainly the, the categories, um, you know, the, the, there's some categories that have, uh, um, you know, suffered a, a short term hit, um, you know, experiential in particular, um, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, you know, and, and not just the restaurants and bars, but also the, you know, the larger format entertainment anchors, uh, movie theaters, and frankly, movie theaters uh, have an uncertain future, although, I'll, uh, you know, especially um, as they're now closing the theatrical window, as it's called, um, and, and uh but, you know, the movie theaters have faced an uncertain future since, I believe, the 1950s. So, you know, I, I wouldn't really bet against them either. They seem to be incredibly resilient. Um, but, yeah, there, there's an uncertain future there. Um, but those are short-term hits. I think, I think what's clearly a more structural change right now is not so much that we're seeing the end of – uh, soft good shopping. Um, I mean, we're obviously a lot, all of the department stores, even the relatively strong ones, um, have been, uh, having a rough go of it. And obviously a number of inline mall chains as well. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, two bits of caution there. I mean, one, um, 
I think the the the, the causes for those struggles um, are 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 sometimes oversimplified. In many cases, uh, they were bought um, by uh, by companies that did uh, burden them with a lot of debt. Which, when it came time to make some key improvements um, in terms of uh, more of an omni-channel model, they were uh, lacking the financial wherewithal to make um, or to fund. Uh, so, you know, and that's with a, a surprisingly large number of these retailers. Um, that said, there's clearly been a move um, in, in clothing, um, in soft goods in general, uh, not uh overwhelmingly to e-commerce which I'll talk about in a minute but also just to other competitors you know as I'm saying the off pricers have been growing year after year since the great recession um uh you know e every quarter uh same store sales increases um more openings um outlet malls if you haven't noticed there've been a lot of those built in the last 12 years and, and Contrary to the past, they're being built in the middle of cities, Philadelphia fashion district, right? The old uh, Galloway Market West, so Market East. So, um, you know, there's a lot of new competition out there. Uh, and, and so some of this is just, you know, building a better mousetrap. Um, uh, you know, so that, that so that's another, um, uh, you know, another, another qualification to make. But, you know, in terms of e-commerce, you know, just to say a word on that. Um, I, you know, as I, as my blog is titled, I, I tend to, um, gravitate to the contrarian view. Um, and, and this is no exception. I, I actually feel like the narrative about e-commerce for brick and mortar is, um, uh, has become so entrenched, uh, that it, it's very hard to dislodge, um, uh, preconceptions about, where they are headed vis-a-vis -vis each other. Um, you know, just, just, you know, if you look at COVID, uh, and, and the crisis we've been, we've been working through, um, you'll see a lot of articles that talk about how this has been e-commerce's shining moment, right? And, you know, following this crisis, uh, you know, their market share will just continue to rise exponentially. Um, and, you know, for one thing, I would never, uh, bank too much on what's happening when things are as unusual as they are right now. I don't know about you, but yeah, I'm shopping for groceries online right now because, you know, don't feel like I have much of a choice. I think it sucks. I think the whole experience sucks and I can't imagine I'm the only one, right? So my point here, and I know that's just a subjective, you know, many of you out there might be having a great experience shopping for groceries online. My point is that right now is not the time to be extrapolating anything about how we're going to be acting in the future when this virus is in the rearview mirror. And so, and, 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 and actually, if you read annual reports, which I'm sure a lot of you do, um, retailers, almost every one of them are saying two things. One, they're saying, God, e-commerce saved us in the second quarter. A and two, um, it saved us, but thank God we had all these stores because then we could still do the curbside pickup. In some cases, we could ship from store. Um, all of this existing infrastructure, infrastructure they were uh, very happy to have in place, the ones that did. Uh, my point being that, if anything, this reinforced to them the importance of having that infrastructure um, and that they're going to just be doubling down on the technological advancements to make sure that the online and the offline are seamless. Um, so and I think that, again, that reinforces the importance of physical stores. Um, another point, and this is a. A, a, um, a widely held misconception about 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 online um, online selling. Online selling for retailers is one big money suck, right? You don't make money selling online. Um, uh, virtually every pure play online retailer loses money um, repeatedly, consistently. Um, okay, you say Amazon. 
Well, Amazon actually has only in the last couple quarters started to eke out a small profit on e-commerce, right? Most of its profit comes from cloud computing, where it is the undisputed leader, um, and to a, a, to a lesser extent, advertising. But e-commerce has for a long time lost money and only now is starting to earn some money. And remember, Amazon at its scale is only now starting to earn money. Wayfair miraculously made a profit in the second quarter. <laughs> that was their first profit ever, <laughs> right? Um, and, and, and indeed, that's why so many uh, digitally native retailers started in the last three or four years to open stores. And frankly, that's why Amazon started to open stores. Um, because unless you have the physical footprint, you cannot rationalize the unforgiving costs of shipping, customer acquisition, and returns when you're operating online. Um, so, and to me, I have trouble, and this applies to food delivery platforms as well. I have trouble believing anything is going to take over if no one can make any money on it. Yes, the consumer is king, but ultimately businesses are in business to make money. And if they can't, well, something's got to give. Are we going to start passing on the cost of shipping? Well, that will be a non-starter. Uh, I think a recent study uh, I read, and I've read several, which have basically concluded the same, that I think as much as 80% of Prime users would drop it in a heartbeat if they had to suddenly pay for shipping. Now, mind you, Prime uh, members are paying for shipping. That's why they pay the membership fee. But it's a, it's it's a, a very clever tactic to distract them from from what they're paying for. Right. If they actually also had to pay per order, they would drop Prime, right? So shipping is an expectation the consumer now has, and which it's never going to be willing to pay for, in my mind. So until we have drone delivery, <laughs> shipping is always going to be a, a, a cost that weighs heavily on on margins for retailers, um, and that's why they're opening stores. Um, and then the last point I'll make, and, you know, I say this to a panel full of guys, you know, for a lot of guys out there, you know, the NFL season started on Sunday and it was like the return to civilization, right? I mean, finally we could spend a day watching football. Um, we have all the TVs and every screen, um, uh, you know, uh, this was, you know, the life, right? Well, as hard as it might be to imagine, for, and this is a gross overgeneralization, which I'm going to make anyway. As hard as it is to imagine, a lot of women feel the same way about going shopping, right? And I think the point that's lost in, in the narrative about e-commerce is that we like doing this stuff, right? This is the stuff of life. The, the irony, you know, the, the whole thing about, you know, the internet's going to enable us it will free us from doing all these things, you know, that, you know, that, um, you know, that are so inconvenient and, yeah. you know, are just kind of, a, you know, a burden. Uh, and it will leave us in the end with really nothing to do because those things are what make life worth living. And for a lot of people, shopping is a part of that. And it serves many other purposes besides just going in and getting the ladder, getting, you know, getting tube socks or khakis. It is a pastime. It is a leisure pursuit. It is a, an occasion for social bonding. It is a form of personal reassurance and identity. Um, it means a lot more. And I don't think it's a coincidence that virtually all of the originally digitally native retailers who swore they would never open physical stores were men. I don't think that's a coincidence. Right? <laughs> there, there is a gender element to this. And so um, so that's just my way of saying, and again, I recognize there are women who don't like shopping. There are guys who don't like football. I, I'm not, you know, I'm just saying in the aggregate, the point being that there are aspects of shopping in stores that people enjoy and that we lose sight of that. There are some people who even enjoy shopping for groceries in a store. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and so, um, just to keep that in mind, but anyway, let me, let me jump in here. That was awesome. Um, and, okay. and, and the reason we started this program is because we wanted to relate everything that's going on nationally and internationally to our little Lehigh Valley. That is yeah. not so little anymore. Um, right. we're now identified as a target and we've been on this exponential curve. Um, John, I'm going to ask you to talk 
a little bit about some of what you've seen because I talk to John every day, you know, mentor, best friend of mine. But since we've been working together as him as the chief investment officer of the fund, you know, we're like a tech company now. And John, he's not really a CIO, he's like the CIA, like constantly figuring out how it relates to the Lehigh Valley. Um, but John, can you just talk about, and you don't have to name names, but you know some people in the in the international national space that are hammering into e-commerce, and you know some things about Amazon, if you could share a couple things. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> Mike, you know, all this, all this insight is so important. I mean, we're, uh, Lehigh Valley Private Equity Fund invests in real estate. I mean, so, and a large portion of that, and a lot of my expertise, as you know, are in the retailer shopping center you know, um, area of various types, power centers, you know, strip centers, large malls. I mean, Tejas and I work for the company that owns the fashion district of Philadelphia. I was there the other Great, day. Right. Right. I was there. I was there the other day. Unfortunately, there's nobody there and there's not a lot of stores open and they're going to have a huge problem having spent yeah. 40, 400 million. I mean, the timing was, you know, was horrible, but you know, one of the things is, and we're going to, in terms of e-commerce, um, you know, there's an experience, uh, there's an experiment going on, and that is, is that the e-commerce portion of these failed businesses um, will be successful investments. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with someone who has purchased a number of these. My brother just became the chief technology officer for Models uh, Dress Barn linens and things uh <clears throat> and the experiment is that we can latch on to the former self yep. uh and you know when i hear that i hear what i my thought process from the real estate standpoint goes to well if you're going to be an east seller and i listened to a great interview by the cfo of prologis mm -hmm. it takes three times the warehouse space to house all the product for an e-retailer, and very few people know this, um, and it does to house the similar product mix, let's say at a Walmart. So Walmart online with 2 million items has to keep that someplace. And of course, what is very prevalent in the Lehigh Valley warehouse space. Right. So, you know, there's, you know, what you've been talking about, you know, I, I think of this as a blob that moves through space and and readjusts to what's happening. And you've described some of that, the urbanization of suburbia with yeah. what happened there, the suburbanization, the suburbanization of the urban setting with uh, the promenades and, you know, whatever. So, you know, from our standpoint, we are looking at investments and, it, and I think you hit it on the head on the long term. And what's gonna what's gonna happen? And I think there's opportunities. You know, the hotel sector has been hit extremely well, which Tejas has enormous amount of experience with. But nobody thinks that there's never gonna be another hotel built, and that the ones that are there are not gonna adjust. They're gonna they're gonna transform. They're gonna, you know, I, I read an article about the airline industry with a whole new seating concept. Yeah. To keep people isolated in an airplane. I mean, so you know, in terms of in terms of your experience, uh, and it sounds like what you're saying is that the things that we love to do, and I want you to talk a little bit about really what is the large driver of the consumer. It's impulse buying. Yep. Right. You know, I mean, and you know, they try to recreate that on a website. Here's what other people bought. But boy, you walk by and you see that sweater. You weren't there to buy a sweater. You're yeah. going to buy that. You walk so and that's never going to go away, and that's going to continue to drive the economy, which is a strong one in the Lehigh Valley. It's got three major cities, and you know needs urban, suburban, and rural retail. So if you could talk a little bit about that, one second. Um, what? Yeah. Just real quick, John. We have uh, you said you mentioned Prolog Prologis. We have I think Prologis. I forgot the number, but they have the largest 53. amount of three. Sorry, fifty-three warehouses in the Lehigh Valley. 53 wow. warehouses in the Lehigh Valley, and wow. I think they have some – it's crazy amount of million square footage. Um, right. It's insane how large these are. Also, John, you, you mentioned to me last night that Amazon may become 
one of the largest employers in the Lehigh Valley. Yes. Yes. And they, you know, they're hiring full time workers, not seasonal workers, um, because what's happening? I mean, they're getting the demand and it's not only for their online business, but as Michael mentioned, it it needs to support their bricks and mortar business, Uh, you know, the Whole Foods and the other you know formats. Um, I think probably one of the greatest examples uh and Michael and I are aware of this, of what people thought, you know, was the advent of the Apple store. Yeah. I mean, it became the highest square foot grossing store in the world, just above Tiffany's. Yeah. So, and they're selling phones basically. Um, So, you know, the bricks and mortar, the demise is how long is the demise going on, Michael, and bricks and mortar since it started? I mean, yeah, right. Know. I mean, how much of this is contraction, like structurally for structural reasons? How much of it just again building a better mousetrap? You know, re, I mean, retail evolves, and there are winners and losers to that. Um, right. You know, I think you made a number of good points, there, John. I think I, I'm also intrigued by these um, brands that have been bought out of bankruptcy, out of liquidation and, and, and transformed into online only operations, because I think that at least um, tries to address one of the three big costs that online retail faces, the customer acquisition piece, because people already know or remember linens and things, you know, or models, certainly. Or may she rest in peace or you know er, you know people remember and know those brands and that's half the battle to me i always questioned if you have a new business and all you have is an online presence well what good is an online presence if no one knows you're there right and at least with these brands um there's some name recognition which can help with customer acquisition so it'll be an interesting experiment but yeah i think impulse shopping you know, if you didn't have impulse shopping, <laughs> retail would kind of unravel, right? I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's what makes the most, you know, that's the, mo- that's what's really separates, you know, a, a, a loss uh, from a profitable quarter, right? Is the impulse shopping. And I think there's a certain sensuality to retail that people are forgetting about. And not only in the obvious cases of soft goods, you know, with clothing and, or, or even with home electronics, you know, your, your home theaters, you know, you're not going to buy that online, sight unseen, you know, or sight unheard. Um, uh, but even with the mundane tasks, and that's why, you know, I bring back the case of grocery shopping. When you're in a grocery store, and, and, and let me qualify by saying a well merchandised grocery store, and there are a lot of them that aren't, you know, you are... Um, you know, you are led around the store by the sensuality of uh, of the items there, whether it's produce, whether, you know, um, and, and the right lighting on produce, you know, whether it's the smell of the bakery, none of that's online. Um, and that's even, you know, and, and so I've been very underwhelmed by the digital interfaces for like Instacart. And I mean, it does none of that. I mean, yeah, it shows you what else you might buy based on algorithms. That's that's still an intellectual process, right? That is not that that is not a central one. And I think that 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 is a critical piece that's being neglected in the conversation. Um, but you know, in terms of what you're saying about uh, a market like the Lehigh Valley, um, you know, I think what's interesting right now, and, and again, I don't. I, I do see online's market share um, uh, rising as a result of this crisis. Um, and I just think it will probably hit a plateau in that it's clearly emerging a consensus that, that it's going to be a combination of the two, um, uh, you know, that's, that's going to be necessary going forward. And what you're seeing is not just this uh, – strength with industrial, but also increasingly uh, retailers looking for opportunities to um, to establish hybrids that are one part retail, one part fulfillment. 
Um, you're seeing this first uh, and foremost right now in, in, in the more expensive um, major markets, you know, whether it's outside of New York City or whether it's, um, you know, in, in, in Los Angeles, um, where some of the grocers are literally taking pieces of their foot of their retail floor plate and converting them into micro fulfillment centers, right? So that you have in the front grocery and then in the back fulfillment. Now, obviously, this is only possible um, in in certain places. It, it will, you know, it sometimes requires rezonings, which you know, uh, you know, and, and and municipalities sometimes have very different feelings about about these sorts of conversions because of their implications fiscally and otherwise. But, um, you know, that's been increasingly done. Stop and Shop's done a lot of that uh, in, you know, in Connecticut in particular, you're seeing that. Um, so I, I imagine that's going to be um, a trend for the future. Of course, it depends on the price of land, right? I mean, it, you know, it, it only makes sense when land gets to a certain value that, um, but yeah, in terms of that, that critical last mile infrastructure that can, will increasingly, uh, you know, play an important role. Um, uh, and then, you know, in terms of a Lehigh Valley, there's the question, and maybe you, you all are seeing some of the uh, benefits to this already. There is this question of the extent to which urban flight and work from home will stick uh, post vaccine. Right. Um, I know there's a lot of differing opinions on that. Um, I think where there is some consensus, it seems, is that to the extent that they do stick, stick, that benefits a market like the Lehigh Valley, um, partly because it is within uh, striking distance of a major metropolitan area, Philadelphia. Um, uh, you know, and it, and it does seem to offer a lot of what uh, what is is driving those trends right now. Um, I personally am somewhat skeptical that either of those will stick, or even in the case of urban flight, whether they're actually happening or happening for the reasons that people are, are saying. Um, but, you know, I know there's a lot of difference of opinion on that. And I can, I can definitely see that to the extent that they do stick, that will benefit a Lehigh Valley. And I'm a mad, you know, I'm guessing you, there's been a lot of conversation there on that subject. Um, um, so that, you know, that will obviously um, be something to watch, uh, especially, you know, post vaccine, if, 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 if that continues. Um, but yeah. One of the, one of the things, Michael, I, I pulled up, I was able to find a, uh, uh, an early recording of your great great grandfather in 1920. <laughs> he said exactly the same thing. And we were right. on a nine year year tear up until 29. And if history gives us any hindsight, we won't have the great stock market crash and depression of 2029. We will bypass that. But you know, history tells you that you get past pandemics. I mean, the Roaring Twenties, there's a lot of good things that'll happen. Unfortunately, we'll probably forget a lot of the lessons that we learned over the past, you know, uh, year here. And uh, but, but how about a more recent example, John? Right after 9-11. Yeah. Is, is that Very true good. about your grandfather? <laughs> no. No, no, but he could have. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I mean, that, you know, yeah, go ahead. Hit it. After 9-11, you heard, and, and I get that 9-11 was a different experience than, um, than COVID has been for New York, um, uh, a different sort of trauma. But that said, after 9-11, you heard a lot of the same things. You heard, okay, people aren't going to want to live in cities anymore. No one's going to ever want to work in an office tower anymore. Um, we were all going to cocoon. We were going to spend time only in our apartments and houses and never leave unless we had to. Well, we then proceeded to have two roaring decades um, and arguably, uh, you know, cities like New York and San Francisco needed a correction like this because there were there were um, there were a lot of uh, trends emerging in recent years that were just ultimately going to be unsustainable for cities. 
Um, but yeah, we, you know, 9-11 happened. There was this kind of fear. And then we saw what happened thereafter. So, and, that, and I caution people, I, and again, I know that this has been different for New York. And, and frankly, uh, it's it sounds like it's been even more traumatic. I, I've actually been hunkering down on the West Coast because that's just where I was when this started and haven't gotten on a plane since. But, you know, that, um, it's it sounds like it's been even more traumatic. But still, uh, the point being, we don't really know Um to what extent any of this actually becomes more than an immediate uh, uh, visceral response to a deep trauma, you know, and. Um, well, and I think, I think just quickly, I think it ends up being uh, this, this enormous pent up demand. Yeah. I mean, people are, I mean, I walk around the streets a little bit and go and there's just, you know, people are waiting outside to go into a restaurant. They're, you know, uh, they're they're listening to the news and whatever. So, you know, I think even more. I mean, Tejas and I, uh, you worked together. Um, you know, two thousand six, two thousand seven, two thousand. You know, during then the great, uh, you know, recession that happened and the banking, you know, problem. Um, it didn't feel like the world was going to end, although. Think about what was happening during those times. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, what happened, and you know, one of the things that we looked at, you know, we look at is jobs. Uh, you know, what's going to be the effect on jobs, and obviously, the basic uh, everyday the guy who gets the job done, unfortunately, is the person who gets laid off, but they get reassigned, and you know, whatever. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day. Um, it drives kind of what you look at day in and day out, which is the consumer economy and the types of real estate that we invest in that supports either an office to go to, a hotel to stay in, a store to shop in, a medical facility, a government building, uh, all these things uh, that once we get a vaccine, once we, you know, beat this you know, virus, all this pent up demand. I, I can't imagine people are dying to go to social events, to concerts, to, to be with people. I mean, I, my thought process is, wow, you know, there was a, I'm in South Philly, South Philly street fairs and where people, yeah. it's just an amazing thing. People are waiting for that to happen. Can't wait for that to happen. Yeah. And that drives, you know, the retail environment. Let me let me jump in because we are we are we we have to conclude. This is our longest program we've ever had, and I don't want to stop this. But Michael, I'm going to ask you right now on the spot: Will you come back in like a month? Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, this is, uh, this is fun. It, it, it's too good because I'm also curious to see your next piece of writing after the yeah. next, you know, couple days. Um, but I, I will say a big piece of what all four of us are doing is. Um, taking the world of unpredictability and a lot of what we've talked about today is psychology and, you know, human being behavior. And Jeremy and I, almost every single person we've had on this podcast typically talks about psychology more than they talk about business or real estate. Yeah. And, you know, it's just becoming more pervasive in what, what mission we're doing now. So it's really cool because Michael, I don't think of you as like a human, you're like a computer. <laughs> <laughs> that you know really feeds this data and, and and i don't know how old you are but you know i grew up i made my first website when i was like 10 years old with html and and i'm seeing all this happen right like we're here we launched a private equity fund in the midst of covid and we waited until now to, to start our 60 month fundraise and and a lot right. of it has to go together with what we're all doing you know jeremy has a bunch of properties that he may be 1031ing out of soon and and the market's yeah. really good. So just to bring it back home, um, you know, we have so much data, so much information. It's all on our website. Um, we now have the capacity to put your article on our website, if you'll allow us right. to. Do of course. And, and, you know, the big thing here is to keep communication going. And if you want to talk to Michael, he's not that hard to get a hold of. But clearly, he's a very busy and knowledgeable man. And, and he's been doing a lot of great stuff. Um, John's available as well. You know, we're, we're raising money for this fund. And Jeremy, we have some great things for Real Estate Investor MBA. But I wanted to thank you guys and try to round out quickly. Yeah. I appreciate you joining with us, Michael. 
Um, yes. Yeah, I can't wait to to the next one. Um, I had a list of questions that I didn't even get to ask, uh, but this was tremendous. I really appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks you for having me. All right, guys. Cheers. Let's keep it going. Have a good one.